and no friend of Christianity, but a well-known scholar, says there's not the slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Crossan also said that, that he was crucified is as sure as anything can ever be. Paula Fredrickson, another scholar, says the single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pilate on or around Passover. Finally, no, no conversation would be complete here without Bart Ehrman, who says, one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on the orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. These scholars are saying it is so abundantly clear. All the sources are in agreement that Jesus died on the cross. There's no reason to think otherwise. This is one of the most powerful facts of history. That is what they're saying. There is no argument to the contrary. In order to say that Jesus did not die on the cross, we have to take it sheerly off of faith without any reasoning whatsoever. And that is not what we find in a historical investigation. Well, what about the argument that Jesus claimed to be God? This is also of extreme importance. Did he claim to be God or not? If he didn't, then Christianity falls. You can't have uh, salvation from a man's blood. You have to have salvation from someone who holds an infinite account, able to sacrifice for our sins, and that would be God alone. Did Jesus claim to be God? Well, when we look at the earliest source that we have about Jesus' life, the earliest biographical source, let's call it the book of Mark, we can see that Jesus clearly claimed to be God. Now, I would love to go into all the details here, but how much time do I have left? We have uh, ten. ten. Ten minutes left. Well, good. Um, I'll get as much detail as I can. Now, Jesus referred to himself in one title for the most part. This title that he used is a title that no one else really referred to him with. Pretty much Jesus' favorite title for himself was the Son of Man. Now, what is this title, the Son of Man? Does it mean that Jesus just claims to be a regular man? Well, let's see how he uses it. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41, The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks. Whoa! This Son of Man has angels at his disposal and he has his own kingdom? Let's keep reading. Matthew chapter 24. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wow, when this person comes, lightning is going to flash from the sky, or at least that's how it's going to seem. That's how powerful and majestic this Son of Man is. It doesn't just sound like a weak human. Let's look some more. Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. In His kingdom, remember Matthew says that He has a kingdom and He has His own angels. Now He has His own throne full of glory. We read on about the Son of Man. When the Son of Man comes, will He find faith in the earth? Luke 18. Luke 21. But keep alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape these things that are about to take place and strength to stand before the Son of Man. Whoa, you need to have strength to stand before the Son of Man. There's something so majestic about Him that it strikes fear into hearts of people and they need to have strength. They need to pray to have strength to stand before the Son of Man. Well, this title, Son of Man, then, doesn't seem like just a regular person. Maybe in certain circumstances it does, but at least here it doesn't, clearly, when Jesus is using it in at least these five circumstances. What is this Son of Man? Well, Jesus is very clearly alluding to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. In this section of the Old Testament, Daniel, a prophet, is looking in the night sky. This is in the Old Testament now. And Daniel's looking at the Father, the Ancient of Days, sitting on a throne, being worshipped by angels. And then, as he's looking at God, the Father, he says, I kept looking in my night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This Son of Man who approaches God the Father is given a dominion, he's given a kingdom, he's given glory. People of every nation and language will serve him. And by the way, that word serve is the Hebrew word latruo, the Greek word pelach, which is a service due only to God. The 130 times it's used in the Bible, that service is only ever given to God, with one exception. And in that one exception, God cursed the people because they gave it to someone other than God. That service is always due to God. Yet here, in Daniel chapter 7, it's being given to one who looks like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. People serve him in a service due only to God. This man has his own kingdom. He has glory. He's being worshipped, ladies and gentlemen. And this 
Son of Man, coming on the clouds of heaven, is exactly what Jesus calls himself. Mark chapter 14, verse 62. He's responding to the chief priest, Caiaphas of the Sanhedrin. Caiaphas has just asked him, Who are you? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus responds, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. He quotes from Daniel 7.13. This man who receives worship by all nations, men of every tongue. He says, I am that Son of Man who will come with the clouds of heaven. This passage is rife with divine intonation. We can actually see that the image of someone coming on the clouds of heaven is an image that's reserved for divine figures alone. Yet Jesus claims it for himself. In the same passage, he refers to the divine statement, Ego a me, I am. This I am statement is something that Jesus says over and over again in very powerful ways. John chapter 8, verse 24 when, uh, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Whoa, wait a minute. Unless I believe that you are, unless I am, what is that about? And why will I die in my sins unless I believe something about you? That makes no sense. You're just a man, right? Clearly he's intonating something greater. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. What is he saying? Well, he makes it very clear just a few, chapter, a few verses later. John 8, verse 58. The Jews have just said to him, You are not yet even 50 years old, yet you claim to have seen Abraham. They're saying, you're not even 50. How do you say you've seen Abraham? Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. Wow. Jesus claims to exist eternally, even before Abraham. And these are the exact same words he chooses to respond to chief, the chief priest with. I am. And you will see the Son of Man coming to the clouds of heaven. It's powerful. It's powerful. Now, I just have a few minutes left, and I want to address how I responded, ultimately, when I saw this, when I was still a Muslim, and I see this information. I realized, wait a minute, this information is extremely contrary to what I was taught in the Qur'an. The Qur'an said, He was not killed, nor was he crucified. But everyone else who's not Muslim says that this is one of the most powerful facts of history, that he was crucified. Why should I believe what the Qur'an says? The only way I could convince myself to believe what the Qur'an says about the death of Muhammad is if I first said, Islam is true then I will believe the Qur'an. I had to be circular. There was no good historical reason for me to believe that Jesus did not die on the cross. And what about the deity of Christ? I've just referred to a few sections from the, verse, from the gospel, of Math, uh, gospel of Mark. There is so much more. I just don't have time to cover it right now. But over and over and over again, from the earliest gospel to the last gospel, from things written outside of the gospels, from things written outside of the Bible, we see people over and over again ascribing to Jesus deity. Whereas the Qur'an said he never claimed to be God. He says, no God, I never told them to worship me. The problem is that the Qur'an was written 600 years after Jesus in a land 600 miles away from Jesus. Muhammad, unless we assume that he is true and he is a prophet, unless we assume that, we have to ask the question, where did he get this information about Jesus? And we find out that the information that he has is from various sources he even has information from false apocryphal gospels. For example, chapter 3 of the Qur'an, verse 37, verse 44, are taken from the Proto-Evangelium of James. This is a false gospel written under the name of James 150 years A.D. Chapter 19, verse 23 of the Qur'an is taken from the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew. This is a book that was written probably five to six centuries after the death of Christ. And yet, this is taken and included in the Qur'an. Chapter 19 of the Qur'an, verse 29 through 31, as well as chapter 3, verse 46, is taken from the Arabic infancy gospel of Thomas. It's an interesting account. As soon as Jesus is born, he starts talking and proclaiming Allah to the people, the moment he is born. Why would Muhammad say this about Jesus? Well, because it's found in the Arabic infancy gospel, a book that is a late forgery. Chapter 3, verse 49 of the Qur'an, chapter 5, verse 110. This is the verse I referred to you uh, when it says that Jesus breathed life into clay birds. Why would Muhammad say this? That Jesus had the ability to give life to clay and to turn them into birds? Why would Muhammad say this? It's a, it's a strange thing to make up. He didn't make it up. He found it in a forgery in the infancy gospel of Thomas, a book written 170 years A.D. So we find that the Qur'an tries to gather things that are written in its area, in its time frame, to tell us about Jesus. But I'm not going to refer to something written 600 years later than Jesus, 600 miles away from Jesus, when I can turn to something that's written very close to his time, the Gospel of Mark, written no more than 30 to 40 years later, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, the writings of Peter, the writings of Paul, the writing of the author of the Hebrews. Why would I go further away than what's clearly stated? And what do they say? 
Well, they ascribe things to Jesus that are powerful. They say things like he is the creator, that he is the savior, that he raised the dead, that he is the judge, that he is the light, that he is the glory of God, that he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the redeemer, the bridegroom, the forgiver of sins. He's worshipped by angels, addressed in prayer. He's the creator of angels, and he's confessed as Lord. This is what we find out about Jesus from the earliest testaments that we have about him. And I will choose to believe what they say over anything that came later. That is what we can know about Jesus. Thank you.